here soon to be live on, on the Facebook group of the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees. And I will start the Zoom recording very soon. Okay, we are live on Facebook. This is the link if anyone wants to join. Soon to be live on, on the Facebook group of the World Network of Psychiatric Team. I have to remove the sound because I don't have trouble sound. Okay. Okay. Ready to start. We are three minutes past. Welcome to the third uh, virtual forum of, of the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees. My name is Victor Pereira Sanchez. I am a child and adolescent psychiatry fellow, second year, almost finishing in New York City and NYU. Uh, and I'm originally from Spain where I did the residency and medical school. And I was uh, very much involved in the European Federation of Psychiatric Trainees and from there we we expanded our, our network of, of colleagues um, through continents. And well, in 2008, the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees was just an idea I had in my mind. And I was um, sharing with a couple of people uh, and I presented it at the uh, annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. Um, and there were two people there, just two people in the audience. And these two people, Thankfully, they are very good friends of mine now. They are in the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees. So uh, last week or two weeks ago, we presented at the APA. Uh, again, it was virtual, but we talked about the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees and there were 80 people watching it live. And I was happy to say that the world, in, during these last three years, the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees has grown significantly. And I will show you uh, now. So, um, First of all, welcome and thanks to all of you who are joining late in the night or very early in the morning. Also some of the panelists I know, they are uh, going to speak at 4 a.m. Um, and they will, are going to speak very well. Uh, we have put together this panel that uh, my co-chair, Sania Virani, is gonna talk about. Um, just before we start, um, I want to, to share some some updates about the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees, uh, some very nice updates. And the first one, the first one is that, well, most of you remember that, um, most of you remember that we did a couple of weeks ago, we started a crowdfunding for the first time to get the money because all here, all we, what we do is pro bono and, and, but also you need money to do some, to do some things and we wanted money to do uh, a very nice website um, because we didn't have our own website. We were on the social media, we were in the, we had a profile on Mental Health Innovation Network, but we needed uh, a website. So we, we called for a crowdfunding um, and, um, and yeah, we were expecting well, to get some money, not very much because uh, most of our members come from low and middle income countries, but we, yeah, our expectations were, were, were met and were, were surpassed actually. So in 13 days, uh, 14 days, we were able to get more money than we needed. So we asked for 1,500 1, and we got 1,620. So, and most of it come, came from very little donations from people from all over the world, including people from lower middle income countries. So thank you to all of you who donated. Some of them are not even trainees are not even psychiatrists, but they, they believe in this idea. And thanks to all of you who wanted to donate, but because of technical issues or lack of money or whatever, couldn't make it. So thanks to that, uh, our website is, is, is real. And this is the first time that it's shown publicly. So now you can go to worldtrainees.org and, and we are on the World Wide Web. Um, 
So this is the, um, yeah, the first uh, rendition of our website. Uh, as we grow, as we do more and more things, we will keep improving it, uh, adding more functions. But this is the main page. Um, you, can, you can click here to see the recording, to watch the recordings of past fora, and also to see the posters of the, and, and the links to join the next fora. You have here um, a link to go to the page to join us. It's, it's also here. And also you have a contact us, and you have here all our social media. Um, so right now, as of today, we have 200 and 293 members from, from six continents and 62 countries and two virtual meetings with today's meeting. Uh, we will have three meetings and where are people comes from. So we, we have here our nice uh, real time map. And, and as you see that, um, that our members come from all over the world, um, we still have some we still have some 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 um, yeah white spots, especially in Southeast Asia, Central Asia, in most of Africa, uh, Scandinavia, and and in many countries in Latin America. Most of our countries, as you, uh, of, for members, as you see, come from low and middle income countries. So actually, Indonesia has uh, is the country with most members, with forty eight, and Brazil is. Almost, uh, almost there. Nigeria has also around 40 members, and and we are growing in the United States, and and we are incorporating new countries. Uh, we have Jibril from Ethiopia. We have Nuha from Sudan, um, and we have a growing presence in India, where they establish their own association. Um, and we have one member from China. It's it's difficult for them to join because um, because of the internet. Um, restrictions but um, but we are going global um, so again you have links to become a member to join our virtual fora so I hope all of you the next thing you do well if it's not too late to you is, is share this website with with everybody to see some of the history we are working together with the EFPD and the early career psychiatry section of the of the World Psychiatric Association here are again the links um, and here you can see um, our next fora that is happening now, so people can register um, and our past fora. So here we'll have the recordings. And, and yeah, after this meeting, we'll put the, re this is going to go to past fora and, and the recording will be available on YouTube um, for people who want to join us. Uh, so if anyone here is not a member and is eligible, is a current trainee, so please join us, uh, click and join us. And, and here you have more information and, and, and a video of instructions how to join us. And here you can fill the form to join us. And once we receive your form, uh, you'll be a member of the, of the World Network Psychiatric Trainees. And finally, uh, there's an option for, for people to reach out to us. So you can leave here a message and here for now, <laughs> We have a temporary office that is my small office in, in Park Avenue in New York, but uh, <laughs> hopefully one day we'll have uh, our own office. <laughs> and, um, and this is all for now. So stay tuned. Uh, in the next uh, weeks and months, we, we are going to take major steps um, in the one of our psychiatric trainees. We are already doing um, paperwork to, to get registered internationally as a nonprofit so that we can, we can, we can have a structure that is more, uh, more stable. Um, and, and we will also enable working, more working groups so all members can be, can be uh, empowered to, 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 to be active in the, in the Federation um, and to, and to, and to work uh, to participate in the exchanges, global exchanges that we want to start after COVID, and and other other things. So I yeah I use more time than I was supposed to, um, <laughs> and even if I'm the founder, it's not uh, it's not good. So I want to introduce now uh, my co-chair Sanya Birani, who is uh, uh, an addiction psychiatry fellow at Yale University, and by the way. She has the best uh, podcast uh, about psychiatry 
um, in the podcast is called Finding Our Voice. You can search it on Google. You can search it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find the podcasts. And um, and and the latest podcast is, is about Asian Americans, but the podcast before was about women is in academic psychiatry. Uh, so it has a lot to do with, with the topic that we are going to hear about today. Sanya. Thank you so much, Victor. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. All 45 of you besides myself, welcome to the third annual WNPT and meeting. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Victor, for the introduction. I'm not, I'm going to spare you the details. I am at Yale University and I'm going to Brown next year to do uh, my forensic psychiatry fellowship. So residency has been a fun ride and, and fellowship as well up until this point. Um, I am very um, honored and happy to be a part of uh, the World Network of Psychiatric Trainees, uh, especially, you know, building it ground up uh, as I joined the bandwagon somewhere halfway along the way. Um, I, and since Victor, as you can see, is obviously super passionate about this whole endeavor and knows, and you can see what it means to him, I will say that um, my understanding of what WNPT essentially is, is a, is a very strong networking base and portal uh, where essentially it's not just about connecting people, but more about connecting people with people, connecting people with ideas and people with opportunities. And that is really what Victor and I hope to do, at least through the medium of this meeting today, where we have with us 10 very wonderful mothers. And in um, celebration of the just gone Mother's Day, we hope to honor them, hear about them and their experiences through life and beyond. Um, and also I, I I think that, uh, you know, before I start introducing uh, some of the mothers who have kindly shared very interesting one-liners about themselves, uh, I will say one thing that uh, as the premise of the WNPT as I recognize it is just, I go by this, this dictum, which I'd heard very recently. I think you can have everything that you want in life if you just will help enough people get what they want. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I am going to start introducing the 10 mothers slash panelists that we have with us today. Uh, welcome to all of you. I will read out some of the one-liners that they sent me. So we'll start off with Margaret. Margaret is a mom and a psychiatrist when not positively impacting lives, watches cartoons and mystery movies with her family. Margaret, if you wanna wave out to people, they will, they will be able to recognize you. Um, next on this list, we have Siobhan. Siobhan is, Siobhan is the queen of multitasking and she's skilled at overthinking. And she wants to be a psychiatrist since, she wanted to be a psychiatrist since a teen uh, in search of that elusive work-life balance and, to, and has to watch Paw Patrol and likes daily against her will, likes the daily against her will. So welcome Siobhan. Um, next we have Raka. Raka who is a child psychiatrist from the UK and mother of a brave musketeer. And she helps children find their strength with compassion, playfulness, sincerity, and believes that a physician, that physician mothers with children with complex needs deserve a place at the table to make every workplace a truly inclusive one. So welcome, Raka. Um, next up, we have Ramya. Ramya. Ramya says she cannot limit herself to one line, which is fair, frankly. It's, it's a very hard task uh, to limit anybody to. <laughs> One line. So she's a tiger medical mom who is living in two parallel realms, the middle earth and a parallel universe of space dinosaurs. Welcome, Ramya. And Dolapo is um, a mom and an early career psychiatrist from uh, Nigeria who derives pleasure in helping others and positively impacting teenagers and youth. And Nuha is a junior psychi a psychiatry trainee who has great hopes for children and adolescents with special needs in Sudan. Um, everybody needs more than one minute, okay? They're going to, we're going to hear from them very, very soon. Next we have, I'm sorry if I get the pronunciation wrong, Eka, Eka Chir, Chiryanti Zain uh, from Indonesia, who is an early career psychiatrist and a medical lecturer, welcome. And finally, one of my old friends and colleagues, Ala, who is an immigrant doctor, mom, and entrepreneur from Egypt. 
uh, who wants to make the world a better place for her little girls so that they grow up into a future where being a mom is not a burden. Welcome to all you beautiful people. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Sarah El Halabi to take us through this wonderful photo collage that she has for us. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. So my name is Sarah, and I'm an incoming uh, psychiatry resident at Westchester Medical Center in New York, and part of this wonderful network that Victor put together. So I'm going to be sharing my screen for you all. Uh, Victor, could you please allow me to share my screen? Thank you. Okay, I can now share my screen. Okay, so this is a beautiful photo collage that we put together as members of this network. The idea first started when um, Laura sent a picture of her beautiful daughter Sophie to the WhatsApp group we're all in. And, and there, you know, we had a conversation about what being a mother is in today's world. And so we came up with this idea of putting together pictures of different moms and one dad, um, different parts of the world with their children. And I'm just going to quickly go over the names of the moms uh, and the country they're from. We have Margaret from Nigeria with her wonderful boys. We have Irina from Ukraine, who by the way, put these photos together so nicely. We have Ahmed um, and his wife Gamzi, who's also a psychiatrist, I believe, and from Turkey. You have Ramya uh, from New Zealand. We have Natalia from Ukraine. We have Ozgi from Turkey, and we have Siobhan from the UK. And alongside this beautiful collage, I've put together a creative piece and I'm going to read it on behalf of the group. Mother's Day is never just a passing day. For some, it is a day of celebration and joy, a way to rejoice in the small and great bearings of motherhood. For others, it is a day of great sorrow, for people mourn the loss of their mothers, and for others, it is a day of great, great deliberation, of questions of identity and representation. People who wish to be mothers, but couldn't. People who have strained relationships with their mothers. People who never met their mothers. People who could not be with their mothers. And the list goes on and on. But what I find most interesting about this day is that as we look upon the world from our own positionalities and life experiences, we can almost all agree that mothers are an intimate golden fabric intimate golden thread in our human fabric, and that the precious and some would say sacred form of relationality was, is, and probably always will be a part of the human race's most universal and celebrated forms of love. I sometimes think as a woman who does not have children of her own, of the great beauty of this world and how fortunate some of us really are to have experienced this kind of love. And now of these photos, Don't let this sentimentality, however, deter you from the great weight of navigating multiple identities in today's world. On one hand, as women in academia, there are professional identities, who we are in our work settings, what kinds of clinical practice or research we're invested in, and our dedication to our patients. On the other, there are our personal identities, our gender, sorry, our race, our nationalities, our sexualities, our political views, our spiritual or religious views, should they exist. Our cultural and ethnic backgrounds, our economic and environmental practices, our moral compass, and frankly, what we are thinking when we first wake up on a Sunday morning and have a minute to spare. And with that all, what the world believes our time and effort is worth. I cannot think of a world that publicly applauds mothers that does not make space for their motherhood. Alongside the romantics of a mother who is full of love and who bestows upon the world a thousand blessings, there lives another parallel reality, that mothers in medicine are human beings who are showing up to the table, a very tough table, we can all agree, and doing their best, trying to give the causes and people they believe in their time and effort. I bring this to an end by asking you all to think of how we are facilitating that recognition. How are we creating a world where mothers are seen completely? How are we contributing to society that allows the weaving of all these threads into the tapestry of a more just human life? 
and how are our actions today contributing to the choice that a mother will make when she wakes up on a Sunday morning and realizes she has that hour to spare? What will she do with that hour? And how are we all as people, as humans, sharing this planet and co-creating our world? Not only by facilitating that women are able to do work, and even there, we can argue we can do better, but also how women love, rest, choose, and be. Shukran. Thank you. And while I did not plan to include my computer's background as part of the speech, but this is Arabic saying al hub thawra, which means love is a revolution. And so let's do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And um, so it's good also that you put a face to Sarah. So Sarah is organizing the next uh, WMPT virtual forum will be the fourth. Uh, we don't have date yet um, because we want we, we are preparing it very 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 with a lot of of, 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 of love and and we want it to be to be a, a very nice uh, forum. It, it's gonna be a special. Um, so Sarah is from Lebanon and, and she is in, in, in New York. Um, well, she's going to be in New York very soon. Um, she, uh, and, and so, so the next forum will, will, will be centered on the mental health of people in Lebanon. Um, and, and we will include uh, people uh, in, in Lebanon working uh, in mental health, different uh, with different uh, from different positions, we will include people in the United States of America, and we will um, we will have a we will have a GoFund campaign. We'll have a crowdfunding campaign uh, attached to the to the forum. So those of you who want to join, you can you don't need to pay anything, of course, as always. But those those of you who can donate to the uh, so it'd be great because Lebanon, as you know, has been suffering a very long uh, multifactorial crisis and needs dollars um, urgently uh, because they have a, a very, very, very complicated financial situation. And this campaign uh, to raise money will be directed to our colleagues uh, working uh, in mental health uh, and leavers in Lebanon. Thank you very much, Sarah. Okay, um, Sania, would you like to be the masters of ceremonies? And, and so, so we will have now the main part of the of the event, that is uh, each of the mothers um, speaking. Um, and we we have to say, um, so we have a panel of ten mothers. Uh, only, unfortunately, only nine can be here, um, and the one that is missing. Um, is, 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 is Natalia Garrido from, from Colombia. She's in Spain, in Seville, and she's absent because she's doing, uh, she's doing what she has to do as a mother and, and, and attending a family emergency. Um, so this is part, I think, uh, this, the, even though it's, it's sad that we cannot have her, but I think uh, her testimony here and, and, and I think her absence also is, 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 speaks about the topic and speaks very well about the topic that we are going to hear about today. The, the mothers that are psychiatrists, they, they, well, everybody has emergencies, but, but um, sometimes they have family emergencies, have to take care for their children and, and they have to do so even if they have to miss uh, an event like this. So we are so happy that she's, she's, she's there where she has to be. Okay, uh, Sanya, you can uh, give the voice uh, to people following the order of the poster. Sure, absolutely. So thank you, Victor. And uh, like Victor was saying, in order of the panelists that have been placed on our WNPT annual meeting poster, I'm going to start calling out your names. Um, so when I do that, would you please take the center stage and, and talk to us about your experiences or things that you found most meaningful? Each of you will have about four to five minutes to go through stuff and we will, we will keep going on. Um, the audience is welcome to put uh, comments, uh, questions, et cetera, in the chat box, or even raise your Zoom hands if you'd require. I will be monitoring that and keeping a track of things. Uh, we are hoping to collate all the questions at the end 
eventually so that we don't become, you know, we don't get derailed um, in our in our schedule right now. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to call upon Adepo Oluwa Dolapo from Nigeria. Welcome. Is she here? Yeah, she's here. Maybe she's mute. Okay, yes, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. Um, and I'm saying good evening from Nigeria. I am Dolapo, a psychiatrist from the Neuropsychiatric Hospital in Abeokuta, Nigeria. And I am a mother of three children, aged nine and seven, a set of twins inclusive. Um, today, I want to welcome everyone present again and thank Victor for this opportunity. I will be discussing becoming a leader in the midst of our busy schedules and multitasking on different levels as a mom, doctor, and trainee. Um, I would want to state that a mother is saddled with responsibilities of caring for her children and supporting her family. Being a successful mom requires hard work, ability to counsel, and making ourselves available for necessary care and support. A doctor who doubles as a mom would have to be responsible at work and also care for other patients while fulfilling her role as a mom. When that doctor becomes a trainee, it's much more work to do, much more than before. In the midst of all this, she can still be a successful leader. During my period of residency training, I was the vice president of the Association of Resident Doctors, University of Illinois Teaching Hospital. And I was also the chief resident. And I ensured residents' presentations were well organized while working in hand in hand with my superiors. So to become a leader while being a mom and a trainee doctor, you need inner strength and resilience. You know, as a mother, you need to build resilience um, by keeping yourself diary, reminders of your task for the day. You also need to seek out for necessary connections and help. Um, for example, I got a tutor for my children and um, also a driver to pick them from school and someone to help with cleaning. Whenever you have opportunities for people to help you, please accept it um, so you can concentrate on other important things. But always note that mothers are usually emotional about their children. So it's good you still monitor whosoever is helping you to avoid danger or possible ill health. Furthermore, as a mother, you need to plan ahead, set targets for yourself with good time management skills. Once you start working with a target, you would hardly lag behind with your expectations. And um, I, but during my period of training still, I found out the least possible time to complete my training and I worked to achieve it. I only had a delay of six months because of the COVID pandemic. While driving to work, I would keep reciting the things I had read the night before to ensure I had mastered them well. Also, um, while I was preparing for my finals, my son had a brain surgery. That was, that's one of my challenges as a mother. It wasn't an easy period. I would leave his bedside by evening and join a group discussion to refresh my thoughts and help me study better. I thank God that he's a lot better now, he's fine. Um, you also need to get a mentor. You need a mentor who understands you and would put you on your toes till you have reached your goals. Um, you should also show care to others. Don't just get overwhelmed with your concerns alone. Listen to people's concerns and prefer solutions. 
Furthermore, you should um, help people with their presentations. Uh, um, you can you can give pieces of advice to help them uh, make it better. This would help improve your self-esteem and make you better in the midst of your challenges. And lastly, I would want to say that whenever you have the opportunity to take up leadership positions, please accept it. Um, the more you work as a leader, the better you become. So in summary, I would say combining leadership position with motherhood responsibilities as a trainee doctor is possible. The key points I raised are building inner strength and resilience, plan ahead, set targets, ensure good man time management skills, get a mentor, show love and care to others, and accept leadership opportunities. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Margaret. That was very inspiring. One of the things, you know, the, the most important striking things about of being a woman and a mother, although I'm not, I'm not a mother, I think is that they have so many facets to them. The whole idea of being a leader, the idea of being resilient, the idea of asking help and taking it when you need it, uh, and certainly not considering yourself beyond all the struggles of life. I think um, it is a whole big package in and of itself. So thank you for sharing some of your ideas and, and part of your journey with us. Um, let me let us now move on. And I, I'm noting that one question we have in the chat box. Um, so let me move on to, and I'm sorry, I misspoke your name, it, you, Dulapo. I'm really sorry. I, I was reading the, the panel list, I'm sorry. Let me no move on to the next speaker, um, Siobhan Matike from UK. Siobhan, would you like to speak to us? Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Sanya. Losing the village and rebuilding a new one. Hi, everyone. I'm Siobhan Matekin, mom of two super energetic and delightful boys, aged three and seven. I graduated as a doctor in the southern state of India called Kerala and moved to the UK with my husband and then pursued psychiatry training in the UK. I grew up with a significant influence of extended family and cousins of various ages in a tropical country. Summer holidays were by default in my maternal ancestral home where my grandmother, my uncle and his family lived. He has seven children, the oldest my age and the youngest my godson. Plucking mangoes, monkeying around on trees, doing singing, dancing performances together, midnight mass with extended family on Christmas Eve, doing Mandy designs on each other are just some of many fond memories. Fast forward to my life as a new mum quite soon after relocating to the UK. I must say that my situation was probably way better than most international doctors who had young children in a new country, as you'll hear from some of the panelists today. This is because my parents also had relocated to the UK before me and I would get some support from them even though they were in a different city. The hardest bit was the year when I lived on my own in a town without any social network, let alone mum friends, back at work and my five month old son attending nursery. My husband was doing a master's and when he did start working as a doctor, it was in Wales, which was more than four hours away. So I used to swap my night shifts for weekends when he would be around. Survival mode prevailed, days became months and years, I absolutely hated the winters, but they passed. And I completed all my psych exams and got my MRC psych degree. I had my graduation in the headquarters of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in London while in the third trimester of pregnancy with my second son. It was a dream come true because I wanted to be a psychiatrist since high school. We were much more settled in the UK during my second pregnancy. And I was now eligible, unlike the first time, for paid maternity leave. I took 14 months this time off, and despite another emergency C-section, I recovered and coped significantly because of a very helpful and supportive husband. There was also lots of peer support from social media, doctor mum groups, and other networks this time around. Just as I was getting adapted to the exhausting juggling act of two young kids as a medic couple, the pandemic hit. We have all probably been through hell and back in many ways since then, so I won't go into that. Though the pandemic isn't over, when I reflect, I miss my homeland 
even more than ever. This is the longest I've been away from India, more than three and a half years. I'm doing well in my career and the reasons I came to the UK are still very much valid. But the truth is, it does indeed take a village to raise a child. And I just need to look at my medic friends raising kids back home to realize that I am sacrificing that village for other things in return. Is it worth it? Should I go back? I do not know, time will tell. But my yearning to raise my kids and be a doctor in a place where I will never feel like an outsider consumes me more than ever nowadays. I realize painfully that my kids will never have some of the memories that I had. But for now, I'm consoling myself that they're growing up in a multi-ethnic, multicultural part of England. My seven-year-old's best friends are immigrants from Gambia, Poland, and Lithuania, which I think is beautiful. And maybe he will learn about things that I never knew or heard much about during my childhood, including social inequalities, racism, homophobia, and so much more. So in a way, maybe we are slowly building a little village here, a global and diverse one, and maybe the future isn't as dire as it sometimes feels to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siobhan. Always seeing the bright side of things. I'm excited for your sons to grow up. Maybe one day I'll get to meet them. Um, so I'm still looking at the chat box. Doesn't look like we have questions for Siobhan specifically, but I'm manning it still. Um, if you want to go ahead and put something, be our guest. Um, the next speaker we have is Eka Charyanti Zain from Indonesia. Again, I apologize if the pronunciation is all over the place, but welcome. Would you be willing to share things with us? Thank you, Sanya. Uh, I would like to uh, do a share, a share screen. Is that okay? Thank you. So, um, Hi everyone, I'm Eka from Indonesia. I remember the strong feeling of overwhelming, unfulfilling, not enough and loneliness in my motherhood experience during my psychiatric training, especially when I have to do psychiatric community service for six months in a three different remote areas, two months in each area. At the time I tried so hard to admit that those feelings were valid. And I bring my two children with me because I live in a patriarchy culture. I was taught to still be responsible of my kids despite of my working condition. I thought that getting residency program in psychiatry would make me immune to those kind of negative feelings, but I was wrong. Those show me that me as a mother, even a psychiatric trainee's mother are just humans who try their best with all flaws naturally. One of the most vulnerable moments in the remote area with children was when I found out that the condition of one of the remote area was actually worse than people told me before. When I first came there, I found that the situation was, was no electricity for six to 12 hours every day. So my children has to sleep outside and then um, no clean water for almost two weeks in a month and the other two weeks is limited clean water and I remember I took a bath with only two water deeper daily and set the rest for my kids and also no good internet signal for almost entire days. I also on vegan diet at the time because my breastfeeding son has severe allergic reaction to almost any meat and dairy products when I'm actually a fan of those foods. And miserable yet funny things was, I found out that I received a male schizophrenic patients that I had just administered a Lodomer and Diazepam in this bed. And right after that, I take my daughter at the time with fever and moderate dehydration due to the typhoid fever infection and um, to that emergency room next to the, thanks to my patient. So this is my, uh, my daughter and this is the schizophrenic patient. They only have uh, one emergency room at that remote area. So uh, after my daughter getting the emergency procedure, I decided to 
bring back uh, and bring back her and treat her at home. So this is with uh, her, uh, my son. And then um, I really want to go home at the time, but I had no choices. I couldn't get back home except staying there for two months. Otherwise, there will be no other young psychiatrist who can replace myself and give service in psychiatric field. And I feel responsible because I brought my kids in this kind of situation at that day. And every day my daughter asked me, are we going home tomorrow? It's every single day. But until then I said, yes, we're going home tomorrow. And um, do I feel as a bad mother at the time? Yes, <laughs> that's my answer at that time. I remember that I cried in front of my colleagues because I feel that I'm no longer can bear all that motherhood challenges in that place. And I don't know, one of my colleagues take the picture of me, this, this picture, crying and send it to WhatsApp group. And it made all things felt even worse at the time. But then, yeah, uh, another colleagues then keep supporting me. And I, I still have support from my husband. Yeah, with, with that kind of signal things. And I learned so hard from my experience that by the time life puts us live in the daily struggle of very human basic needs, what well, usually we are not, I learned that the only way thriving is by love. And from this love, I find five important values, which are divinity, uh, caring, and then connection, security, and hope. I love my kids. The bond is so strong that I have no words to describe it best. This love is not just a feeling, but it's a capacity as mother. I believe that we will and we can when we ground it out love. I can be resilient in the midst of difficulties because of true love from the divine that I find inside me and radiate it towards. And the kind loving soul is the way where God will send his helping hands and blessings that is our soul in facing every challenges. And tonight, I will not be able to share this story without God's helping hands in loving me, my kids, and my family all along from the very beginning. Last, as Eva Saskin, a woman rights activist, ever said, you don't have to be a mother to experience those values. You can think and act like you are a mother to the people in need to make a better place in the world to live in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eka. I think all of us are going to need a few seconds after that. Uh, it's incredibly touching. I, I don't know what it means to be somebody in that situation, but all my admiration and all my love. Thank you. you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, all right, let's go on to the next speaker. Um, Ramya Darshini Vadivel from New Zealand. Ramya. Hi, can you hear me? Perfectly well. First of all, Banakam and Kira from New Zealand. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me at this wonderful forum. It's such an honor to be among such brilliant stars and friends worldwide. My topic today is titled, I Manage, Travels of a Medical Mom Through Depression. This talk is something that's very personal to me, um, something I've learned to be passionate about. I'm a mother, I'm an early career psychiatrist, I'm an academician, I'm a free spirit, and I live with depression. It has certainly been a journey of acceptance and advocacy for me in the past three years. In 2016, um, I was expecting a little one. I'd previously been diagnosed with reactive depression almost a decade before, but was doing well without your treatment. But I realized how much in denial I was with this impending doom of depression. I made such an extensive birth plan that only, I suppose, perinatal psychiatrists would be proud of. I had an advanced directive with my husband on what I wanted if I was severely depressed. I detailed the medication that I would have liked, 
breastfeeding plans, um, even ECT, if I was going to be psychotic, overtly depressed and catatonic. As a psychiatrist myself, I decided it was going to be easier to rationalize this feeling and hence I would do what we would do, monitor my mood, try and do the right things. And then I just waited for the worst. But things went well. We're migrants um, and had moved to New Zealand pretty much around the time. Um, so it was me and my husband without the village that Shivan was talking about. And we did what needed to be done. We were practical and yes, we managed. Um, at five months, I returned to work full time, got straight through my training needs, blitzed my way through exams, and actually managed that through diapers, sleeping, uh, sleepless nights, um, the pumping, the burping, you name it. But there were certainly days that I'd sit at my desk and just cry. I said to myself, I was exhausted, and this would pass. But the ex the exhaustion, it creeped into all areas of my life. I felt hollow, like it was taking 200% to be me, and I couldn't keep the act up. I think it was easier to deny that this was what it was, uh, as I excelled in clinical work with my patients, with my team. But there it was, you know, just peeping over my shoulder, that familiar stranger I didn't want to know, Madam Depression. Um, it took me two very dear friends and senior colleagues to get the help I actually needed. I was ashamed. I wanted to hide. I started to fear that I wasn't the good enough mother if my child would have a secure attachment. Uh, um, if I was emotionally available for this young being, I'd have nightmares wondering on the ripples my illness would have on my family. I felt like I'd failed them, that I failed my son in particular. I never let him see the tears. The closet quite literally was where the crying would be. Um, very few knew what was going on until I felt I needed to take some time off. And it was devastating. I overheard that I was too well to be depressed. I had managed to somehow hide how I actually felt, always had a smile plastered to my face um, and did the work that was asked of me. Um, things that I would hear over and over again from my colleagues would be, she can't be depressed. She got through her exams in one go. She's just reviewed, I don't know, some piece of literature. She's done guidelines. And the thing that went over and over again is she's just too happy for that. And then I kept wondering, is this all in my head? And um, I hid further. It took me another relapse and my three-year-old wiping my tears, giving me cuddles to accept that this was me. This was it. I was depressed, clinically depressed. Uh, it took me courage to tell my team that I needed to give myself some time and space. I told them that I was depressed. I had depression. There was radio silence. My supervisor told me this was career suicide, pun intended maybe, uh, that having this, tag, this diagnosis would make me unemployable and perhaps I shouldn't tell people about it as my work or my abilities had never been compromised. I was made to feel guilty to take time off for therapy, for appointments, um, to reduce my hours, add that, to parental leave, to be with a sick child, to be with your child's events and activities, that was unacceptable. And the elusive glass ceiling that we talk about felt inches above my head. I remember being told that it wouldn't take much to let go of me. I decided to tell my story because it needs to be told. I might have explained depression to my patients and their families a million times. Um, explained to young mothers why they need to get help, why they need treatment, and discuss fantastic stories on acceptance and bearing down stigma. None of that applied when it came to me. Being told I needed to be strong, uh, that I was a psychiatrist and knew what needed to be done, that I had to monitor myself, but wasn't allowed to be human 
and take the time to heal, that I was now a mother and I needed to pull my psychiatrist mum socks up, that I needed to fix myself and be wary of the discomfort I would be causing others, but no one, I repeat, no one wanted to call it depression. Sometimes we find strength in places you least expect. I wore this badge without shame. I built a tribe by sharing my story, banded with young mothers in healthcare whose stories needed to be heard and needed support. And one thing that limited us was the myth that our mental health couldn't suffer. And for some, that they needed to be less sensitive women. Thanks to my boys and my tribe, I not only survived, I thrived. Struggles with mental health are real. We are psychiatrists. Doesn't mean we are immune to these struggles. In fact, we're more at risk. So let's be kind to ourselves. Lend that shoulder, that ear to a friend who needs us. Let's spread the word and let's lose that shame. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ramya. You you much, Ramya. Uh, I just want to, to say very, very moving and, and we stand here by you and um and it's no not a secret that the founder and ceo of the world network psychiatric training is well doesn't deal with depression but does deal with anxiety uh, general anxiety disorder since he was a teenager and one of the things his psychiatrist tried tried to tries to to convince him to not be involved in too many things um and in part is true but one of the if i have to cut things um I wouldn't cut uh, being with you here in the World Network Psychiatric Genius. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Victor. Um, Rami, I think I'm going to just start calling you my rock star because it just it just sort of goes with your name. I've decided. Uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And I can see that Precious's um, Zoom hand is raised. So if we have, we have one minute to take that question, if you prefer doing it now, or we can hold off until all speakers speak. But Precious, do you want to go now? I, I don't know if you're on mute, uh, because I can't see your video either. So... I guess let's let's move on for now. I will keep this in mind and we will come back again. Um, let's move on to the next speaker. We have Ala Elnajar from, from the United States. Ala, welcome. Thank you, Sanya and Victor for having me and thank you for um, all the moms on this panel. Um, I feel like it's really hard to speak after hearing all the stories. Um, um, you, I usually uh, prepare a little bit before I I speak on public, but for for today I feel like speaking out of my heart after hearing what's going on. It's it's something very close to my heart. Um, so I am uh, a mother of two girls, um, nine years old and six years old. Um, originally from Egypt, currently in New York, um, moving to Rhode Island this summer for after finishing my child psychiatry fellowship here in New York. Um, and um, I'm blessed to be with this panel to talk about motherhood uh, during training because my story is actually having my kids throughout my training. So I did my first psychiatry training in my home country of Egypt and then I got pregnant and I had my first daughter in that training Jasmine and um, then follow up with another residency here in, in the United States and then finally the fellowship and um, graduation is coming very soon in less than one month um, um, feelings of um, thankful that I uh, almost survived and what well, almost finishing up my training. Um, there is so many things that could be said about the journey um, that five minutes will never be enough, but I really uh, wanted to give the last three minutes to talk about kind of how motherhood has been extremely difficult after COVID. Uh, for us in New York, it's really hit us hard in March and we're still living in it. Um, 
for me, I think um, the most painful time is where we think um, me and my partner of what will we do as an immigrant if we caught COVID and we both ill, who will take care, care of our kids? And I think um, I never thought in my life I would think about that, about writing that on paper, writing legal documents of um, where the kids should go if something would happen to us. And I think writing that um, um, has took me very hard to step back and look closer inside uh, into my own family life. Um, being a person who love to give the community and being a leader is not just part of who I am, but it's something give me joy to help other rising people in their work and just applying what, whatever I learn into others. I think it's the motherhood instinct kick in as well. But that's just kind of like always this question about how do we balance? How do I balance being a mom and a doctor? And this uh, continuous feeling of um, juggling the balls and making sure that none of them fall off the floor create this huge stress that even when things slow down, even when we try to take care of ourselves, and I will speak up personally about myself, we kind of need the permission to do so. And feeling that it's okay to take care of ourselves. Um, so I hope from my sharing this part about COVID, this slight feeling of being an immigrant and not knowing what to do with the kids. I, I know one of the panelists talks about treating a patient while having their kid uh, on the other side. And I had severe goosebumps because that story was blocked off my mind when I was an ER um, resident. And I, I had to bring my kid who was having fever into the ER because school asked for someone to come pick her up and my partner was three hours away and I was the only one who can pick her up and I couldn't leave the ER because there was no one else to cover. And I think this feeling of um, constant um, conflict of balancing fall not solely on the mom, but to very big extent to the mom. It is our job to figure it out. And I would leave you with this one message. It should not be solely our job to take care of our kids and our career. It is a job of a community that provide child care, emergency child care, when the mother in the ER need to take care of a patient, there must be a resource for child care not in a one in hundred companies, it should be in every workspace. We are not, should not be responsible for providing the financial coverage of the childcare, the extra financial childcare, when that emergency like COVID happened and deal with it, you decided to be a mom and a doctor. And then when someone comes to me and ask, like, I don't know how you do it, you're a superhero, you're a superwoman. I'm telling you right now, I'm no one superhero, I'm just trying to survive. And I don't want to be a superhero. And please don't call me that. Just give me the support that I will feel okay to survive, not asking even to thrive, but it feels like it's too much to ask. So that's me. Um, and I hope we will have some future for our kids where that should not be that hard to balance. Thank you so much, Allah. Thank you very much. And I will put in the chat the link, but um, 
Allah and I have something in common apart from being IMGs is that we are both finishing the Channel Analysis and Psychiatry Fellowship and we we are both apart from our busy lives and her life is much busier as you understand now. Um, we are also founders and, and, and CEOs of different associations that uh, and we, we like to spend time in, in helping other people. So I will put the link uh, she found that uh, Body Space that is uh, an online platform to support uh, colleagues and especially uh, trainees in the United States. Yep. Um, so Victor already stole the words out of my mouth, Victor. So because I will say one thing that having had the privilege of uh, knowing Allah for a number of years now, our paths have crossed on numerous occasions. I, I think the first time was about three years ago, maybe two and a half. Uh, you know, we both were in New York. Um, I think that this woman has not only survived, she literally has thrived. I've watched her. I've watched her go from one goalpost to another with a lot of ease. I have watched her shine. She was at one point the APA Diversity Leadership Fellowship Chair. Uh, there, there are so many accomplishments to this woman's resume that I would be, I don't even want to start at this point. Um, but I am um, very honored to be your friend and colleague, and I hope that uh, we will have many more associations in the years to come. And Ala literally is also one of those people with a very generous and compassionate heart, because if she stands for something, she will make sure that she will lobby a lot of people and garner a lot of support to make whatever it is that she wants to happen at, at that time. That's a very, that is a sign of power. I don't, I don't know if anything else really is. Um, so with that, uh, thank you, Allah, and we will move on to our next speaker. That is uh, Margaret O'Hare from Nigeria. Margaret? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's a little muffled. I don't okay. know if you want to come closer to your, your device. Okay, is it better now? Marginal. All right, so okay, really good evening from Nigeria. Um, thank you. It's an honor for me to be part of the panelists and have listened to inspiring, unique experiences from amazing mothers. I will be speaking from the perspective of a mother who has had to defy the stereotype of being a doctor or the stereotypes of being a doctor and a mother are too mutually exclusive events. Coming from a patriarchal um, society, a society that does not ask if a man, if it's possible for a man to be, to have a great career and be a great dad, because the definition of a great career is being a great, of a, of a great dad is being a great, um, of having a great career. A society that has not really encouraged, before now had not really encouraged women to be doctors. I am reminded of my uh, medical school days when um, we there's this mantra that um, that we had, that was there that um, females and there are no females and there are no males that everybody is a male and females shouldn't expect their preferences. It wasn't like we were expecting to be given some concession or something, but the discrimination was palpable, and the worst. Um, for me, one of the worrisome announcements was in my 500 level when we are told that any woman or any female rather that got pregnant or that got married will automatically have a receipt because they felt that anybody, any female that had time to get pregnant or had got married wasn't serious and had too much time on their hands. That was worrisome for me. I wasn't ready to get married in medical school, but that for my desire to, to finish medical school and go and change the narrative out there, uh, make it less discriminatory for females who intend to work. And so with um, hard work, diligence, and the right attitude, I actually had this smile on my face because I just want to be down. I completed medical school with, with the optimism that um, postgraduate would be much better and things would be better out there. It would be more, we'll have favorable condi um, conditions. And I've been inspired by females who had great careers and were great moms, both locally and internationally. 
But my chagrin, when I got into the residency training, it wasn't so. It was um, a Herculean task being a mother. I had actually deferred residency somewhat. It's not as if it was very easy to uh, get into residency though. But I deferred it for a bit so I could complete my family circle or so I thought. So my, my third child was um, six months when I started residency. I'm sorry, I should have said I'm a mother of four boys. My first is 14 and my last is four years. So I am, um, my third child was six months when I started residency and six weeks into the residency program, he had started prep and somehow picked uh, a, an infection and was on admission. And I had called my superior to tell him, my senior colleague rather, to tell him I wouldn't be able to come in because the, my son was ill and all that. And he didn't believe me because he felt, oh yeah, here they come. He's trying to dodge work, he doesn't want to take call. And he was going to give me a query. It took, um, so I had to take my call. My son was there, I was taking call and all that. And um, it was until a colleague of mine, the same level came to visit me one of those days and he was, oh, it's, she's really going through stuff here. And that's when the query was dropped, but I still had to take my call because people were ready to swap. I could only extend it for a bit. Did it get better? Not really. Um, somehow, during, um, I had my first um, child. I was pregnant with my first during residency and it was really a tough one. I was sick most of the time and I couldn't get up easily because um, the, the, the discriminatory attitude that um, working mothers are less committed, they are less competent was there. The, the bias is universal, but for me, in my case, I think it's worse with female to females. We have this, um, I don't know if I should use the honeybee syndrome thing, but we are less empathetic. I found more, I, I got more empathy from my male colleagues, my male um, senior trainers. They were more willing to put me in lesser, in less stressful things, but somehow that didn't work. I had to go through the rigors of all that and coping with the pregnancy, throwing up and feeling busy and all that. But for me, those things were, I didn't, I decided not to look at them as, as um, negative experiences, but I saw, I, I turned it into strength for me. I, I, I channeled it into positive energy that um, were motivating for, um, factors that drove me to passing my exams early. And um, I needed to go change the narrative out there, let people know that we can walk and we can be great models. And of course, that meant that I had to really work harder, read more. I'm, I'm carrying a baby on my back. I'm reading and walking. I don't sleep enough so that I could cover up and all that. I look back now and I relish those memories, but I also had to cut down on several things, urgent and not important, not urgent, not important. I pushed that aside and just focus on the important things. But that did not stop me from giving my children quality or giving the family quality time, not so much as the duration, but in the, in the quality, ensuring that they have lasting memories. I am not there yet, but I'm grateful really. I forgot to say I'm really grateful for all the experiences because I, I, I am happy to say that I have younger colleagues who come to meet me and say, wow, you mean you raised four boys in residency and you didn't have, I didn't have the privilege of having house help or people helping me in the house or just my husband and a few friends, just one or two who I have to leave the children, leave them here, drive there and all that. But it's been amazing and I'm glad that um, people are beginning to see that we can have mothers who are actually competent, who are dedicated and they can still have a great career. Um, my life is not near balance, is not near balance at all. I won't stop trying to balance it. I'm just trying to integrate work into my life. My idea of a great career is not so much as in big things, but just engaging in goal-oriented activities and making impact in people's lives. But I must say that I couldn't have done this without my husband, who's been very supportive. He's my husband and my children, they're constantly, constantly rooting for me. They've been the wind beneath my wings. They've allowed me to sow and um, allow my career to grow. The shoulder that I cry on and all that. I recognize that there's some women who don't have that. And it's really, really, really 
um, terrible for them, but I believe that with um, conversations like this, we can get the word out that yes, we can have a great career and yet a great mom. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. I wanted to show very real quick. Um, so, so Margaret won the, the, the photo contest of the latest World Psychiatric Association um, uh, annual meeting. And, and, and it was great that the WPA uh, recognized uh, her, her challenges and her joys of, of being a psychiatrist and in that moment attending the World Psychiatric Association meeting um, along with her children, with our children. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your, uh, I don't really know you, but your sunny disposition and your smiles, despite all of the challenges, is just making me very, it's, it's warming my heart. Um, so we're at 5.13. We're obviously going to close promptly at 5.30. Um, let me move on to the last speaker that we have for today, because one of them is missing. So let's go to Natalia Grinko from Ukraine, please. So can you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Natalia Grinko from Ukraine. This is my elder daughter, Anne. And I have youngest one, but she is sleeping because it's midnight in Ukraine. Thank you, Anne. I'm clinical psychologist. Oh, she went to sleep. I'm clinical psychologist from Ukraine. I graduated from medical university, and or I'm from a family. All are doctors, surgeons internal medicine, so they were not really happy about my choice to be a clinical psychologist. Well, I was never discouraged by my relatives to become a um, clinical psychologist. Uh, I start working as a teaching assistant at the medical university. I moved from a small city to a big one. And I met my husband, fall in love, and I had two beautiful daughters, nine years old and seven. Uh, here in Ukraine, I have approximately five years or virtually vacation. It was a long period of time. And I have to admit that I was, I was, I had a feeling that, that I, lo I was feeling lost. I don't know how to um, explain more clearly, but uh, being mom, it was not enough for me. And I was finding some opportunities to, to be a scientist or to work, but without no support. So five years had passed very quickly. I came back to work. And in 2018, it was a seminar on comorbidity in Kyiv where I met Professor Norman Sartoris. I have to say it was love at first sight. Uh, I, Professor, you are the most uh, prominent person I have ever met. And you, uh, Professor, enlightened something in me from inside. Next step, 2019, I had a course on leadership and professional skills by Professor Norman Sartorius, and it was my first trip abroad. At those moments, I was 35, but still young psychiatrist abroad, not in Ukraine, but in Europe. And I, had, I think that um, my daughters were believing more in me than I, I was believing in myself. I have to admit, I suddenly realized what I want to do and whom I would like to be. I started my, and finished my PhD program. It took me 10 years. Two months ago, I defense my PhD degree. Uh, I applied for different schools and from that period of time, and I'm not scared at all. And uh, in the middle of summer 2019, I was a Ukrainian representative of EFPT Forum, where I met so many incredible people. And I am proud to be a community, not a EFPT, but WNP. And uh, Professor Norman Sartori was also a key speaker at those forum. I think you are a good sign for me. Every time when I move abroad, I can see you. And um, you know what? I start my uh, psych I start my psychotherapy training. So right now I'm in my third year of psychotherapy training. I am 37, and I still think that I have a bright future inside of me. And uh, being a mom is one of the most positive changes in my life. Yes, I have some challenges because in my birthday vacation, my daughter, she was undergoing surgery. She is without, I don't know, 
Koledo who holds this action, he is without organ. So we have a diet restriction till the end of the, li the life. But it, it was not very easy from the start, but it's very easy right now. And uh, with start of pandemic, COVID-19, we were all COVID positive. But my youngest daughter, she was in critical case for about a month. So I'm happy these things are over right now. And I, it's a privilege for me to be a part of such great community. And I have to admit, um, let no one and nothing discourage you from being who you are. In, it doesn't matter in which period of your life you are right now. And being a mom is the most incredible part of my life, not the only one. And being a scientist, even from a small city in a huge in a huge world. I would like to say that I'm a very small girl with a very big dreams and just want to make a difference, not to only my girl, but the rest of the world. So thank you for all of you. It's a privilege to be a part of this great forum. Thank you, dear moms, for your beautiful and very, I don't know, encouraging stories. Thank you, dear Professor Sartorius, for um, one of the most important meeting in my life. And thank you, dear Victor, for inviting me to this forum. Thank you so much, Natalia. I think it is extremely exhilarating to be at the end, at the finish line. And not only are you a very beautiful person, your daughters also look, they're, they're so cute. Um, so thank you for sharing that part of your story with us. And I apologize that I missed out two speakers. They were supposed to be at the end. I had a different version pulled up in front of me. So my apologies. We are going to go ahead with the next speaker, Raka, please. Thank you, Sanya, and uh, thank you, everyone. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Uh, we've had some really powerful narratives this evening, and it's an absolute honor to be part of this panel. So I want to uh, begin by sharing something really precious, which is that. And uh, just two weeks after chemotherapy, radiotherapy, my son made this for Mother's Day in the UK which uh, we celebrate three days before um, Easter. Now, this may or may not be proof of my being an amazing mother, but it certainly is proof that some people believed in his potential to make this through all of that. Now, as a mother of a child with complex needs, not only you begin to realize the immense potential of children to thrive, to claim life, but you also begin to realize such strength in other people, in yourself and your colleagues. You bring to the table compassion and ability to withstand heartbreaking challenges, a view of illness, not as a condition that you must necessarily cure, but as a journey through which you must preserve the personhood of the person on this journey. You must ensure it is an experience of compassion and celebration of strength through all that hardship of being ill. Now, in my work as a child psychiatrist, um, I have learned not to be scared of developmental milestones, that communication doesn't need words, that complex clinical decisions need clinicians who are not afraid to face those complexities, who can lead the families with compassion through the uncertainties that life throws at them, and uh, to sit with them when things don't go according to plan. Now, when you've gone through things that have challenged your personal and professional identities, your very being, being a mother of a child with complex needs, you develop the courage to lead someone else at loss, whether it's a colleague, a team, or a patient. Now, physician mothers bring to the table an ability to handle uncertainty with compassion and resilience as leaders. Workplace needs to be more inclusive. Flexible working arrangements, childcare support are some of the things to think about. But before we are able to recognize and encourage leadership, we need to understand the barriers to careers for those with complex caring responsibilities. If workplaces or training schemes cannot come up with creative solutions to retain these, this resilient workforce, it would further push this group of physician carers to be a voiceless, marginalized group. COVID has been devastating, but it has also offered us insights and opportunities to make massive changes in training and service delivery. 
I was speaking to another physician mother the other day with a child with complex needs who said that remote arrangements allowed her to finally work as a doctor. It is sad that it has taken a pandemic for workplaces to wake up to alternative and creative ways of working and truly be more inclusive of its workforce. I've grown up with great mothers. My mother picked up her profession after eight years of being a stay-at-home mother and retired as a professor of economics. My aunt is a physician mum whose daughter had serious health condition as a child, now a successful business entrepreneur. My aunt carried on with her career ambitions and is now head of labs in one of the most prominent hospitals in India and runs a charitable organization to help patients and medical students in financial hardship. And she believes that everyone deserves health and the possibility to pursue their dreams. By being a working physician mum, I'm helping my son to learn that his condition isn't a barrier to his dreams or the dreams of his parents. And I extend that same love to my colleagues. I will stop here. Thank you, Victor, for bringing us all together and being able to learn from each other. I haven't spoken about partners and husbands uh, and others who support us, but I'm leaving that maybe for a Father's Day thing. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Raka. That was very eloquently spoken. And thank you for, for keeping it precise and everything, knowing that we're closing out on time. So I really appreciate your, your doing this for us. Um, now let's move on to really the last speaker of the day, guys. This is going to be Noha Shakir. Noha, do you wanna, do you wanna tell us your story? Hey, hello everyone. Um, Noha Shakir Sayed from Sudan, a junior psychiatry trainee. Um, uh, happy Mother's Day to all of you. Uh, it's a privilege and great honor to be one of you today. Um, I, uh, I've always been passionate about psychiatry since college days, but um, the plan of the Almighty was totally different. I was planning uh, to uh, start my psychiatry training immediately after graduation, but then I got married and had my first son. And by the age of two years, he was diagnosed to be in the spectrum of autism. And since then, my life um, hasn't been the same at all. Um, uh, my boy is nine years old now. Now, and it's been an awesome journey. Um, we uh, are celebrating each and every millimeter of success or and progression. Mm, um, he was almost mute by the age of four and he had lots of sensory um, process problems. Um, and um, daily uh, activities like having a bath, um, having a meal without vomiting at the end of it, um, clipping nails, cutting hair, um, going to a public place is all seems impossible at the beginning of this journey. And um, for um, so many mothers of you, uh, hearing the word mama, mama, dada, or baba, um, it comes so easy and naturally, uh, naturally, and maybe it would be the first uh, or second word to be said, right? <laughs> for me, I have to wait to hear this word five years. Um, my biggest concern that my child has a very high threshold for pain. So um, there are often times I found um, scratches on his body, um, blood traces. He never complained about them. He never even feel that he's in pain. And my biggest concern was one day maybe he would might need um, immediate surgical intervention or something and he wouldn't be able to tell me so as to be able to save his life. Um, my child taught me that anything is possible despite all the limitations and all the situation that he's having, um, he, he is able to challenge, to go through all those challenges and um, um, teach me that anything is possible. Um, he's able, instead of saying mama, he's able now to communicate in both languages, Arabic and English. Uh, he's in a mainstream school and he can tolerate a whole number, a whole classroom speaking at the same time. <laughs> um, he wasn't able to, uh, to like tolerate a single voice uh, of a child screaming or crying one day. Um, my child 
uh, I consider him lucky to be born in an educated family um, and uh, for a certain time we had to leave the country and leave and go to another place where we, we enrolled him in an early, an early intervention center. But I'm here not to speak mainly about my, my boy, Tame, the amazing smart boy. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of all the mothers of autistic children uh, in Sudan and all the mothers of special needs children in Sudan. Um, we have been going through um, a very long era where all the resources of the country were targeted towards war and weapons, unfortunately. And now we are starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. So my, my speech here is directed to those people who are governing us, who are ruling us. We need all those mental health laws to be activated. We need to protect those children, provide them every kind of support that they deserve. Um, we have lots of issues in Sudan when it comes to um, discrimination against those children. Um, some of them are being kicked and dismissed from schools just because they are not smart enough, well behaved and such things. Uh, we need to work so hard to increase the awareness um, about mental illness in general uh, among the community. So my, uh, my words here towards um, uh, my uh, psychiatry trainee uh, colleagues. Um, it's a long process and uh, I, uh, as I told you, I see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, by being in such platform and being able to bring those uh, uh, aspects of the problem to the surface, um, that's the only way we can uh, target them and work on them so that we can create a better future for our children in Sudan. Um, uh, Victor used to call me super mama and super mom, <laughs> and I believe that um, those children are the superheroes. They have to go through all those things um, and prove us that nothing is impossible. They um, teach us to be, they bring the best of us actually. And I believe that my child has brought the best of me, taught me how to be patient, resilient, and um, uh, gave me hope about everything uh, in the future. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's a great uh, honor to be with you tonight, especially in the presence of uh, Dr. Sartorius. Hoping to uh, meet you all in person one day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very Hi. much, Anuha and Raka. Actually, I call you super, super moms because all the moms are super moms. Um, and um, those of you who saw the first version of the poster that was circulating the, during the first one or two weeks, uh, remember that uh, Raka and Anuha were not there. And uh, that was my fault because I didn't think about the super, super moms. But thankfully, um, as the world is very small, um, I had uh, conversations with Nuga and with Raka and realized that they, they deserve a space. And, and, and we, we really, we have learned a lot from, from, from their stories. And, and let's not forget, for, forget about them. So if there's an idea, some, some ideas here to, to remember, one is, one, one we knew it already, is that being a mother and a psychiatrist has its challenges, its choice. We have heard real stories, but now the, the, the second thing, take home message is that there are mothers that you not hear about them, but have uh, uh, colleagues of yours that have children with special needs and, and they, they are so busy <laughs> that they cannot advocate for themselves and, and they are so vulnerable because of that. Um, but also, and as we have learned in the last 10 minutes, they are super, super resilient. And, and let's, let's be their, not only their allies, let's be their friends and, and supporters. Yes, thank you so much, Victor, for nicely summarizing that. I'm sorry, is anybody saying something? And just want to read the comment. So my father is joining from, from, from Spain and he's saying he has put a Joaquin Pereira as my father. So he, uh, you can read there his message. Um, Professor Sartorius, uh, our mothers um, and you. <laughs> um, you like to, to kind of start closing this, this event with, with some words. Um. Thank you very much for inviting me to 
join you. It's really, it was a wonderful evening. Uh, I was always unhappy about Mother's Day uh, since my early days. I, I think that there should be 365 Mother's Days, and then uh, that would be about justice, because uh, they are doing so much. They are doing bringing up citizens, people who will be uh, tomorrow's world. And at the same time, they are also feeling another role of being a professional, looking after people. The tasks are enormous. And uh, they're wonderful illustrated by what we have heard this evening. I really want to thank particularly those who spoke about difficulties which they experienced uh, and who gave us a personal story because we'll remember it forever. I have a suggestion for you uh, and for your forum not a forum, but the, your association. I'd like you to uh, consider this uh, hour, the recording that you have, as something that you would have in your hands to offer as a tool that could be given to other mothers, uh, not only now this evening for one hour and a half, but it'd be like a book that people can get and look at and listen to and be inspired. And provided that the speakers who we heard tonight uh, have, uh, would agree to this, I would think that uh, it would be a wonderful gift to the mothers, many others who are not here present and who could be, uh, who could listen to that, get inspired, etc. And if you think about uh, possibly expanding this, I would also encourage you to maybe add a few more stories, but let them be personal stories. Don't give them book knowledge. Books can be read. But these stories that we have heard tonight are coming from the heart. And I think that they are much more impactful and will be remembered much better. And also they are a complement to what maybe in the books is said. So thank you very much for inviting me. It would be wonderful to see the, the first book of the, your international organization dealing with a, a life as a mother creating the world. And I think that that would be a, something that would really be a contribution to not only to mothers, but to all of us who sometimes perhaps remember, remember don't, don't think enough about the tremendous roles that young women who have children have to play in their life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Artois. And uh, yeah, we'll do that. And, and, and thankfully, as we saw at the beginning, we have well, we have a, a lot of power here, a lot of colleagues with diverse skills. And we have, I won't want to mention anyone, but we have people who write very beautifully. And <laughs> so, so we'll do a book. <laughs> the video will be, will be available this, this evening for anyone to watch. Well, Victor, do we, we're at 5.35 and I want to be mindful about everybody's time, but I wonder if we have maybe a question or two to take before we close or do we have other plans? Yeah, so um, I would like to, to, for those of you who have to leave for, um, um, because it's five minutes past time, I have to thank you very much for joining, uh, to stay in touch with the, with the, with the network to join the network if you are eligible and you are not yet in the network and to share the website and, and to engage with us on social media, to email us if you have any questions, um, to email us if you want to, to reach out uh, to any of the wonderful mothers here. And this is officially the closing of the event, um, but um, our mothers, uh, our panelists, um, have agreed uh, to stay some minutes, uh, some minutes longer, uh, in case you want to 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 ask uh, any questions or put a comment. I know that uh, we have here uh, Dr. Rwanda Gafas from Libya, and 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 uh, I would like her to 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 also speak uh, now. But all of you who have to go, please don't 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 feel obliged to to stay. Thank you very much from. And um, and I was saying that um, I was saying in, the, in a WhatsApp group with the other mothers that I am <laughs> today. Well, many other days in my life, but today I am feeling really uh, sad. <laughs> and, and, and well, I'm feeling that the person who said that men shouldn't cry uh, is is deeply wrong. And <laughs> thank you very much. Uh,
Uh, Rwanda, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. How's everyone? Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm actually not one of the panelists, so I haven't really prepared anything, but um, you guys had great speakers, um, so inspirational. And um, it just made me wanna share my personal experience as a mom and uh, as a psychiatric trainee. Um, so I'm from Libya and um, I got married young as a cultural um, uh, thing, right? Um, I guess similar to all other Arabs, um, once a girl gets married, um, you know, you take care of your husband and the house and you, basically you're done. Um, so it's just um, that you can't think, that you can't um, get married and continue school. So I was in fourth year uh, medical school when I got married. I actually had my forensics exam the morning of my wedding. And because the wedding date was already set and then the exam date was set later, we just couldn't change it. Um, I did, I went and did my exam in the morning and then went to the spa later in the afternoon and had my wedding in the evening. <laughs> so that was my first um, um, event of my uh, life. Uh, and then I took my ophthalmology books with me to honeymoon because I had my ophthalmology exam once I came back a month later. And everyone was like, oh, when you get married, you're just gonna fail and you're not gonna finish um, your medical school. So that just motivated me to continue and push harder. And um, just to kind of prove to family, friends and extended members of society that um, it is doable. Um, I can do it. I can get married and be a doctor. So. I get pregnant and I have my first kid. He's now in grade two. Um, and you know, same thing, society says, oh no, you have kids, you're just a GP now, you're not gonna continue, you're not gonna be able to make it. So that just pushed me even more. Why are you saying I can't, right? Why are you just putting me down? Um, for me, it was, well, a negative motivation, but it still pushed me to go harder. I had my second um, little girl in 2016, and that's when I started um, residency. And then, you know, same thing. Oh, you can't specialize. You have two kids now. And so why, I don't understand why society and relatives and they just want to push you down. Nobody wants to push you up. And so that just motivated me more. I was pregnant with my third kid. Um, and um, I attended my first uh, WPA meeting in Tunisia in 2019. And I just fell in love um, with the team and the network. And, and I saw normal people like me, right? And that just makes you feel good. Um, and uh, I'm still um, in my psychiatry residency right now. And I'm actually writing my board's exam the 20th of this month, so next week. <laughs> and um, you know, don't let anybody uh, say you can't. I actually just won the three minute competition at the last WPA uh, meeting, which was held virtually, uh, which was supposed to be held in Bangkok, but was held online. And um, I surprisingly won, but um, <laughs> um, again, don't let anybody say you can't because you can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Rwanda and, and you're I welcome. Really appreciate that. Uh, also, didn't mention, but coming from a from a country where you have not only the challenges of your motherhood, you have also big uh, political military challenges there. Uh, so our support and prayers for you and your people. Thank you, Victor. We have um, Siobhan wanted to give us a small little analogy. She had uh, specifically told me there's something interesting she wants to share. Sure. <laughs> Why not? It was, uh, thank you. It was just, uh, I can't take credit for the Pearl of Wisdom. It was something I read online, but it was um, from an uh, American novelist. So it was in return to one of the questions about the juggling act. And I think 
many of us have referenced that. So this concept was that all of us feel that way. I'm not saying I've succe succeeded in doing this. So it was this concept about thinking of all the million things in our work life and our motherhood lives as glass balls and plastic balls and that it's okay to drop some plastic balls once in a while mm -hmm. as long as you hold on to the glass balls so that it doesn't shatter so to give an example so my little one's nursery would have like these really um uh, strange days where we have to dress them up in all sorts of things and crazy sock day and all sorts of days and some that you can't keep up with when you're already having a diary lot with lots of things so that would be a plastic ball which you have to sort of give you yourself permission if if you end up messing up uh, i have mixed up the days and sent him on um in pajamas on superhero day when i mix it up with pajama day um and to give the flip side so the glass ball would be when there's something really special for for the child like uh event they're doing something for the first time or for a work glass ball it would be something like a deadline um that you need to get through rather than seeing all the things in in your life as not anything that you can drop and to give yourself permission to that so i i hope i found that really helpful so i just wanted to share that thank you thank you very much, thank you very much. i really like that i think it's just kind of like speaks about uh, if we're gonna summarize a take-home message is the um, the concept of a good enough mother of like opposite of the superhero like just being okay with missing up and being okay with like things are not going to always be um the way things do quote unquote quote perfect but you're kind of like have the quality of the love that you bring to your kid in those little times between all of everything you're managing if you really give the quality time of just like a being there and being present, that means a lot. It's more important than changing the diaper. It's more important than washing the dishes. It's more important than uh, keeping the house tidy, not to minimize them, but to kind of like knowing that it's okay. Doesn't mean that you're a bad mother if those things are not in that place. All right. Thank you so much, Allah. Um, if there is nothing else, should we look to, to wrap up now? I think so. I think all so. right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. All of you wonderful panelists, the most awe-inspiring people I have I met in a very long time. I wish I could whistle, I would, but claps for now. A big round of applause for all of you for having come here spent your time, shared with us your inspiring stories. We have a lot to learn from you. Thank you to the audience who took some time out and stayed, stayed on. Um, all right. All right. You Thank all you. have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Joe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Can I can I say Oluwadolopo? Uh, it was very nice to see your children here. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, nice to meet you. Great part of this event. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Victor and and Sania, congratulations. Good night. Thanks for joining. And bye -bye. have a Thank you. sheet there. Good Hope night. to meet you soon. Bye bye. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Raka and Rako and Siobhan. Catch up soon. Bye. 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 Good night. Uh, it's it's night here. Good night. Good night. Night, Bye. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye, Victor, and all the all the team. Congratulations yeah. for all. For you. Muchas gracias, Papa. Thanks, Father. <laughs> Take care. Good night, there.